All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Beale, who is up in Washington State, just across the uh, just across the water from Seattle. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing fantastic, John. Yeah, and Chris has been uh, participating in software startups as a founder in early stage for most, for about 30 years plus now. And right now you have Connect and Sell and you also have uh, Market Dominance Guys podcast too, So which is, which is great. I'm delighted to welcome Chris to this podcast. And we're going to talk about something non-controversial, okay? So we just thought we'd come up with something very simple. Why pre-call research is a waste of time? All right. Now, that would be, Chris, would go against uh, the advice that most people would offer salespeople. Yes, it would. I mean, salespeople are told that when you call somebody, especially in a cold call, you really need to be completely prepared with lots of information about them, their business, their likes, their dislikes, whether they're dro- dog, drink champagne, all sorts of things <laughs> like that. Right. And um, there's a there's a fly in the ointment that nobody talks about. And so you know, the, the rosy picture is you do your pre-call research and then you call and then they answer and then you talk to them and you have this great conversation because you know all this stuff about them. So that's that's considered just fabulous, like that would happen. Here's what really happens. So 21 out of 22 times you do your pre-call research, you call them and you don't get them. So your pre-call research is wasted. So now we have to do the math and the math is well, you know, say five minutes of pre-call research, right? That'd be pretty good. So my five minutes, I waste 20 out of 21 times. For, so for every one conversation, I waste 100 minutes of research. So that's roughly speaking with the interrupts and everything else between the research moments, about two hours. So I've taken two hours of my day so I can have a slightly better conversation. And so yeah, it just doesn't make sense. It might've made sense in the 80s, Mm -hmm. When pre-call research, which you couldn't do, of course, because you didn't have the internet, we'd forgotten to invent it by then. So you could, if you could have done the pre-call research, then you had about a one to four shot of getting somebody on the phone. But since voicemail became ubiquitous and people started just letting calls go to voicemail, it's now 20 out of 21 and there you go. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, back in the day, we had nothing better to do than answer the phone anyway. We were just glad that somebody was calling, regardless of who they were. And by the way, <laughs> I, uh, I I weaned my dog off champagne early on because it was costing me too much money. So yeah, got yeah. him onto water. Uh, so, OK, so if somebody says to this and say, OK, so if I don't do a call, you know, research before a call, what, what should how should I be investing my time? Well, you should do research before you put somebody on a list to call. That's mm-hmm. a really good idea. And when I say you, I mean somebody. For yeah. most of us, if we're in sales, that probably isn't us. Um, I hate to kind of break it to salespeople, but being a colorblind, left-handed, ADD dyslexic is probably not the best setup to, to work with data. And if unless you were the kid who raised his hand in class and answered every math question first, or unless you love to spend your time in spreadsheets, just kind of wandering around trying to figure out what formula might accomplish what, you probably should have somebody else assemble your list for you. And uh, you know who you would like to talk to conceptually, somebody else can go find that for you. But that's the place to apply the research. And if you kind of back up and ask, what are we really trying to do in a go to market? We have a hypothesis. Folks like X will buy my product. That's the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So now what's X? Well, it could be company size. It could be title. It could be industry they're in. It could be the fact that they just changed jobs, whatever, right? So the X part, we we need. that's our strategy. That's our hypothetical strategy. And we want to validate it by talking to a bunch of people and seeing, do they accept meetings with us? Do those turn into deals? You know, closed loop, all of that. But at the very beginning, we have to make a list and the list is the expression of our strategy. So don't put folks in your list you don't want to talk with, which means you need to do the research in advance. Thank God we have ways of doing that kind of research that consists of this. You go to, I don't know, Apollo and you go right, right. drop down, size of company, drop down, title, drop down, change job in the last six months. Got it. 
push button. Good enough. Let's have some conversations, right? And then you focus on having the conversations and yeah. having good ones. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I think you hit on a good point there, uh, Chris, because I do think that uh, oftentimes uh, people don't have a good idea of who they would really like to talk to or who their target. They have a vague idea of who their target customer is. But then that kind of goes by the wayside a little if they don't get to them quickly enough, then it becomes, I just want to talk to anybody. So they start to broaden as opposed to narrow. Right, exactly. They, they use uh, the challenge of reaching people as the way they shape their market. And if you think about that a little bit, that's the worst possible thing to do because the best people to talk to are the busiest. Mm. I think that's a really good point that I want to underline that for people like the best people to talk to are the busiest because, yeah, I mean, let's face it in, in the world we live in today, if, if I'm easy to get through to, eh, probably, probably I'm not the busiest, most in demand person, and maybe I'm not the right person for you to be talking to. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so that's half of it. The other half is, well, what do you need to know? You actually need to know something that's really challenging which is you're speaking with a human being. And that mm -hmm. means, by the way, this is a hundred percenter. You don't have to worry if they answer the phone and they talk back to you, it's a person, it's not a bot. <laughs> you're not a bot, they're not a bot. So you've got something special going on in terms of knowledge. I know you're not a bot, you're a human being. But knowing someone's a human being and knowing what to do with that are two different things. So most sales reps are taught to lead with value. And leading with value is a disaster in a cold call. In fact, it's almost guaranteed that you will fail when you lead with value. And the reason is this, it's a human being. So you just ambushed a human being and you are now the worst thing in the world, an invisible stranger who ambushed them. So that's another fact you can rely on, it's really reliable. But from that position to say, by the way, this is what's implicit in most cold calls. You are sitting around waiting for a sales rep to call and tell you how to do your job. Yeah. And no, they weren't. They weren't. They are not waiting for you to tell them how to do their job, but they will do a deal with you and they will do an immediate deal. If you show them that you see the world through their eyes and you offer them hard evidence that you can solve a problem they have right now, they will trust you and they will listen to you for maybe 27 seconds. The problem is you're the problem. It turns out to be the best thing in the world. You are the problem. So you know how to solve that problem. Solve the problem that is yourself. So we <laughs> teach people how to say two, these two sentences sound simple, horribly difficult to learn. But once they learn them, they become sort of gods of cold calling, which is, I know I'm an interruption. So that's, I see the world through your eyes, hard, flat, throw myself under the bus before you can. Then switch your voice to playful curious. That's an FBI term for a a special kind of come along with me voice. And then you say, can I have 27 seconds? Tell you why I called? Not may I have, you're not asking permission. You're actually saying I can solve your problem. I get it. I'm the pride. Just told you I'm the problem. Let's make me go away in exchange for you listening to me. Tell you why I called. nice yeah. little deal, simple package. And guess what? They'll trust you. Yeah, and it, and it's really it's really interesting, Chris, because most of the people, as you said, most of the people who who cold call, uh, you know, either they open up with who they are, what company they come from, and all of that, or as you said, they dive into into telling you what your problem is, right? And without ever having, without even really giving you the chance to even speak, they're already telling you that you have problems. Right. Right. And in addition. They're guessing as to your problems. Yeah. And even if those are your problems, they aren't your problem. You only have one problem at a time. And my <laughs> problem right now is you call me. I made a mistake. I just realized I made a mistake. My problem is getting off this damn phone call with my self-image intact. If I didn't have the second condition, the self-image intact you know, condition, fine, I hang up. But I can't hang up because I'm a human being and you're a human being and I I owe myself the courtesy of treating you with courtesy, which is really awkward. And during that little awkwardness is the opportunity to begin a relationship, interestingly enough. And it's, a, it's like every relationship starts at an awkward point. Let's face mm -hmm. it, job interviews are awkward. Asking you know, somebody out on a date for the first time is awkward. All these things, everything that starts a relationship starts with an awkward situation 
And so as salespeople, we need to be masters of awkwardness. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Masters uh, masters of awkwardness, uh, because really what normally happens, let's face it, is the, person's, uh, the, the person who's calling starts to get more and more kind of intense as they know that you are trying to extract yourself and they get more intense about trying to hold you there. And it becomes a, a tug of war. It does. And it, it goes right to the third grade playground. They'll, they will assert them something about themselves that they claim is true that you can't refute. My daddy's stronger than your daddy. No, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. It's that kind of thing. It's right. And as you want to stay off the third grade playground in sales, it's a bad place to go. But you can actually get them from trust, that little trust, because you let them off the hook a little bit, to curiosity. So instead of the path being through value, if you take the path of the conversation from ambush, I scared you, to mm -hmm. trust, because I let you off the hook a little bit and I showed you that I can solve the problem that is me. I gave you a way out of this conversation to curiosity. Now that's an interesting place to go because from curiosity, you can get to somebody committing to taking a meeting. So forget about your product. Don't talk about their problems. Just try to get them curious enough to take a meeting. And that means you must never tell them what problem you solve or they will say, we're set. And when they say we're set, you're on the third grade playground because what are you going to say? No, you're not. They're going to, yes, we are. No, you're not. Yes, we are. Oops. Third grade playground. I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, that, that's an excellent point. Um, and I love the bit about, uh, you know, like you said, 27 seconds. I mean, that's a little random number, isn't it? I mean, but it, it, it kind of like would pique your interest. Yeah. And it's a hard commitment, right? If you can get it done in 27 seconds, it turns out it takes 17 seconds. So here's, here's yeah. ours. We teach people different ones. You'd almost think we're in the training business. We're really not. We offer a school on this. But we're stuck at Connect and so I run this company where we deliver 3 million sales conversations a year, most cold calls. And so it's like, oh, shoot, we had to teach people how to talk, right? That's terrible. <laughs> but it's actually been kind of cool. So we teach them this little way of talking about things that gets you just up to the edge with curiosity. And then you force them to take the meeting. So we say at Connect and Sell when we're selling our own stuff would say, John, I believe we've discovered a breakthrough that completely eliminates the waste and the frustration that keeps your best sales reps from being effective on the phone or even using the phone at all. And the reason I reached out is to get 15 minutes on your calendar to share this breakthrough with you. That took 17 seconds. I'm left with 10 ever extra <laughs> seconds. <laughs> it's amazing. So... Yeah. Uh, and then I can ask a question. Do you happen to have your calendar available? And I ask it in that playful, curious voice, and then I'm silent. You can say whatever you want, no matter what you say. I'm going to say, fantastic. You know, I'm a morning person. How's Thursday? I'll shoot you an invitation. We'll move it around if we have to. And right. then we go from 3% conversion rates conversation to meeting to, I don't know, where Cheryl Turner lives. And she <laughs> works for me. She sets about 35%. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Um, but you just touched on something a moment ago there about uh, people using the phone at all. Uh, I think that's that's something that has crept into into this the modern psyche, if you like, is this uh, phone avoidance. It's like, oh, I know it doesn't cold calling doesn't work. Phones don't work anymore. All of this, and uh, and people have tried to convince themselves that that's all old hat. Yeah, well, I think it's, again, back to the awkwardness. Who wants to do something awkward? It is not awkward to send somebody an email you know they won't mm -hmm. read. That is a non-awkward act. It's futile, but futility and awkwardness are two completely different things. And now you have automation that'll send zillions of emails, right? You can spam without guilt, knowing that each email has been personalized in some way. Oh, you know, John... I heard that your dog no longer drinks champagne and then you know, on from there. Right. And that's supposed to, that would be a pretty good subject line. Actually, that might get, it. I've heard your dog no longer drink, but, and then you might be curious enough to read. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of funny that, you know, we all shy away from awkward things, right? Awkwardness <laughs> is really bad. It's right at the edge of rejection. And we're pretty sure when things get awkward, the next step is we could be out of the village and out of the village mm -hmm. is just slightly worse than death. We don't like it. So, but hey, people don't like the sight of blood except really weird people. And yet we have surgeons who, you know, I've gone to a guy twice in my life, no, three times, who's taken a knife 
and cut into me and spilled all sorts of blood. Thank God I wasn't awake to see it. But he didn't faint yeah. in all three cases. Actually, it was she one time. But she didn't faint and he didn't faint. Why? Because as awkward as it is to take a knife and cut into a helpless person that you conspired to put asleep, and now you've got to look at all that blood, it's for their own good. And so for the same mm. reason, it's for their own good, we can overcome our awkward aversion. The phone, I, the phone has always been awkward. Mm -hmm. It's just now it's also frustrating because you can't get there. It's like, I spend my time dialing to nowhere. And then I say, that's a good reason to avoid this awkward conversation when I can rarely have one. And yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, I know. And that is the excuse that you use a lot of the time is like, oh, but, you know, people don't pick up or the, the number's not the right numbers or, you know, I can't get through. I leave voicemails. Nobody ever calls me back. Um, I'm much better off just sending emails or sending spamming people on LinkedIn. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I can look at our numbers. I'm looking at them right here, not sharing my screen, of course, but this is my team yesterday. And I have the numbers, right? This is just our own team. 9,974 dials across 14 people, 418 conversations with senior decision makers, and they set 23 meetings. I mean, that kind of sounds like business, right? Mm -hmm. 23 meetings a day you probably could be a going concern if you sort of kept that up, you know? <laughs> but the, it, it is true. The phone, the raw phone, I mean, I have to say this because we're in this yeah. business. The raw phone is really frustrating because we waste a lot of time navigating phone calls to nowhere. And that is frustrating. And then leaving voicemails is not very effective. So, um, you know, it's, that's just life. I mean, we have a way of getting around it, but it, it, I wouldn't use the phone unless I had really, really great phone numbers. Maybe if I had all cell numbers and they knew me, yeah, okay, I'd use right. the phone. Otherwise, no, I'm not going to use the phone but I will use a parallel assisted dialer as Justin Michael calls them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, and this has been great, Chris. So before we go, uh, please tell people a little bit about connect and sell and how that works. Well, connect and sell is just a way to push a button and talk to somebody on your list in three or four minutes without any effort. So you go from having one conversation an hour and hating life to having eight, nine, 10 conversations an hour. And if you're any good, maybe you can turn some of those into meetings. So it's a, it's a way of getting a lot, a lot more. And I don't mean a little, a lot more, a lot, a lot more conversations. Um, it's kind of a game changer for culture too, because especially with work from home, it's hard to stay engaged as a salesperson. And as a manager, you really want to know what your folks are doing without spying on them. So it does all of that too. Perfect. Yeah. And listen, uh, and, and if you're getting those kind of rates of meetings, you know, maybe you and uh, come Friday night, you and your dog can, share a bottle of champagne and celebrate the week. I, exactly. I actually borrow my neighbor's dog for that because we don't have a dog here. So uh, <laughs> yeah, big, big dog though can really put down the bubbles. <laughs> I love it. All right. Listen, thanks, Chris. All of Chris's information will be below this video, all the links to connect and sell into the podcast, etc. Uh, so I would encourage you to check it out because, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, it's all about conversations. And the more you can, more conversations you can have, the better. So overcome that frustration and, and get back on the phone. Uh, listen, Chris, thanks again. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.